So we're now going to turn our attention to a short uh, panel presentation by a small panel. Um, and we're going to bring our focus a little bit more to the specific issues and concerns that might uh, impact our communities here on the east side. Um, and so I'd like to introduce our panelists and feel free to come on up um, as I'm calling your name. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Debbie Lacey, co-founder and executive director of the Eastside Refugee and Immigrant Coalition, um, an organization. Yeah, let's give her a hand. Let's give her a hand. Um, an organization that engages with local municipalities, organizations, and businesses to create welcoming and inclusive practices, policies, and investments through consultation, training, and convening community conversations. Um, also on the panel uh, will be Dylan Ordonez, uh, Director of External Relations for the Office of the King County Executive. Um, in that role, he manages relations on behalf of Executive Constantine with uh, constituent and community organizations within King County. Um, he also works with the inter intergovernmental affairs, communications, and policy teams on major countywide initiatives. Um, and lastly, joining them will be, again, Michael A. Hall, um, who we just heard from, um, who again serves as the Assistant Regional Census Manager with the Census. Please welcome our panelists. Um, and so I'll start off with a, a few questions for our panelists, and then we'll really kind of look to you all and kind of open it up to the floor, see what questions are already in the community. Maybe you had some walking in today. Maybe there's some that, that came to mind as you were watching the various presentations. Um, just want to caveat that there might be some questions that our panelists might not yet know the answers to. Um, and also, depending on time, we might not be able to get to everyone's questions. If either of those situations are the case, please keep your questions in mind um, and bring them to the breakout sessions, um, which we'll transition to after the panel. And so to start us off um, with the local perspective, um, I'll put our first question to you, Debbie. Um, what are some concerns about the census that you've been hearing from different communities here on the east side? Thanks, David, and thank all of you. Is this on? Yes, thank you. Um, I think this may, might begin the let's get real part of the, <laughs> of the event, um, just because I have been hearing some things. But before I answer that question, I would love to do um, a real quick poll of the audience. Uh, this I got from my friend uh, James Whitfield at Leadership East Side. So what we're going to do is um, you're going to put up five fingers if you are ready to strongly encourage your family and friends, your community, to fill out that census. That would be at a, a five. All the way down to one, which means I'm, not, I'm really not there. I don't think I can strongly encourage my family and friends to do that. So hold up your hand of which number you're at. I see a lot of fives. I see a few threes. I see a couple ones. Okay, very good. Just wanted to get a, a sense of, um, of you all and how you're feeling at this point. And maybe you've been uh, uh, pro appropriately persuaded by Julie and Michael. So um, a couple things I've been hearing. Um, People are, first of all, a lot of people don't know about the census. The immigrants and refugees that I've been talking with, um, I was just talking at my son's school with two of my good friends, one's from Russia, one's from Okinawa, and they both had no idea that this was something that our government does. Uh, one of them um, was taken aback, the one from Russia, because she, her mom used to work for a um, comparable agency in Russia that did this same uh, count. And she herself, one of her first jobs was knocking on doors to follow up with people who weren't submitting their information. And she said people would not open the doors for sure, that there was a lot of mistrust, um, and that she herself um, did not plan to participate in, in the census here in the United States. Um, the other person just didn't know about it, and so she was happy to get the information and know that that was coming. So there's that happening. And then we have people who are very familiar with um, the census, but also very um, scared. They're, they're, they're fearful. They're fearful about how their information will be used. Um, when we say things like, well, there's Title um, 13, is it, um, that protects your rights, protects your privacy, um, here's what we hear back. Well. Um, we've seen a lot of laws being violated lately by our federal government. We've seen a lot of things happen that are unconstitutional, and it's, um, those things go forward, and then there's lawsuits, but in the meantime, people's lives are being ruined. Or they say, well, um, there have been some uses of the census data that were legal but have harmed communities or put a lot of fear and distrust in us, like what happened during World War II with Japanese Americans, what's happened with Arab Americans since uh, post 9-11. So there, there's a lot of fear. And there's a lot of um, questions about what I think it comes down to when I hear from everybody is that 
there's this dilemma, call it a moral one if you'd like, between really getting the community good that's at stake, really understanding that, and, and, and many of them do. They see these same numbers and they think, this is important, there's a lot at stake if we don't count everyone. But they're weighing that against their assessment of their own personal security and their own family's security. And it's just a moral type of dilemma that I keep coming up against in conversations that I'm seeing with people, is they're trying to grapple with that. I want to do what's best for my community, what's best for um, my friends and family in the community so that we can get the dollars that we need to do these great programs and so we can be represented. But I'm worried. You know, I'm worried about the people um, in my family. I'm worried about my neighbors, people I know who are undocumented. So that, those are some of the things that I'm, that I'm hearing, and, and there aren't easy answers for those, I think. Um, did you want me to see if there's other please, input yes. from yeah, please. anyone else? Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today. I'd just like to echo uh, about everything that Debbie has just said. Uh, we've been doing outreach in King County, across King County for uh, over a year now, and communities are concerned, communities are scared, uh, regardless of the citizenship question, just kind of the, the trust in government, with, um, in particular with this, this current administration, um, the fear is palpable. And, um, you know, I can jump up and down until I'm blue in the face like uh, about Title 13 and, and other, other measures that are being put in place to kind of guarantee the safety of that information. But um, uh, as, as somebody who works for local government, somebody who works for government, community is not going to trust me. Um, uh, let's see. The uh, citizenship question was proposed by Commerce just over a year ago, the end of March 2018. And yes, it is immediately there were a number of lawsuits and there have been two decisions made by lower courts. It, I believe it is April 23rd, the date that the Supreme Court is going to hear the case. And the form, when does the form have to be finalized? Is that by June ish? Well, we said June because we're scheduled to go, we're scheduled to go, we're scheduled to, go to print in June. Um, but we know that if we are forced to have to change or do things differently, that we will have to find a way to absorb the cost in order to be, to in order to meet the mandate that the Supreme Court tells us we have to do. And I think that that decision is going to be a real crossroads of how communities organize, about how people uh, make decisions to participate or not. Because right now there are entire communities where the leaders and people who are, are, are looked to are going to encourage folks not to participate and and that will be you know to the to you know the uh, that particular our region's detriment um but like debbie said people are are weighing weighing both sides and it's really difficult to ask somebody to volunteer their personal information if they feel it's gonna put their family at risk and you know near or long term because uh, ultimately, the data is going to be made public. It's going to be made uh, not down to the individual level, but to you know city uh, you know, census tract down to the block. And so, while you wouldn't have you know be able to pick out that there's a you know a single person at one household, you'd be able to get a pretty good idea of looking at a map, a hyper local map of say a high number of concentration of undocumented folks live in a particular neighborhood. So. Um, just really, really heavy stuff that we're hearing from community. And on top of the citizenship question, on top of the digital divide, um, I think that, uh, Michael, what you mentioned about uh, the fact that after the third or fourth postcard or letter, that homes, households will eventually receive a paper form. I think that that's something that really resonates with folks and is important to, to, to um, remember as well. Um, I'm sure there's, there are more thoughts kicking around up here, but I'll just pass it on to Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that we are, we're quite aware of all of the concerns are that we're hearing here that are going on. And the Census Bureau is doing our best to implement a number of things to help prepare us. And that's why it's so vital that we have groups in here that can go out and push the benefits of things on it. Now, let's, let's go to every incident that has happened with the Census Bureau with data. Even though we didn't release individual data for the Japanese internment, we had aggregate data, but they were able to go in the areas. The, the, the law was strengthened to protect that as a result of that. When we had 9-11, it went back and the law was strengthened again 
to protect for to you know, so every time we've had an incident where there have been cases that we did release individual data, but you were able to get down to a lower level. We put example, we put a disclosure review board together that has to review in headquarters in Washington of all the data that is released. And that disclosure review board has to make sure that it cannot violate or release your individual information or trying to protect it, getting down to the low levels. The lower level of geography you go to releasing data, the more wider the data is that you get that you're producing out to. Another thing that we're introducing that's new this time is called noise, okay? What is noise? I understand that there are very, very multi, multi-conductor computers out there that can take aggregate data and break it back down into the individual data. And you gotta have a mainframe with mega money and all that to make it happen. And I ain't got one of them in my basement, okay? But I can tell you that with noise introductions in there, it prohibits you from being reversing to go back into the data to get detailed data. We're working with Microsoft. We're working with, we're working with Google. We have hackathons that we bring consultants in to see can you hack into our systems and get our data. We have, we have employees that we have, uh, we have periodic hacking sessions where employees get to take time off from their position and actually go in and see can you hack into our data to go in and look. So we are really trying to look at ways. Another thing we're asking partners to do and complete count committees to do is to actually go out there and then you hear things on social media, you see things aren't false. Please go back with something positive that's really happened. Because all we need, you know, if it's on the internet, it's true. <laughs> you know, so we need you to make sure that you are helping us in that area. Great. Well, thank you. Well, uh, in the interest of time, I want to open it up, see if there are any questions um, from you all present. Any questions coming to mind? Yes, here, sweet. What would happen if I simply choose not to answer? Can you repeat your question just so it's on the... What, what would happen if I simply choose not to answer or if I lie? Okay, we have a, we call what's known the post enumeration survey, which is a QC process that we do. Uh, with. The QC process is so independent that once they start the, 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 the QC on there, I'm not even allowed to touch the doorknob to that room uh, because I'm involved with things. And as far as you refusing to lie, there is an actual penalty for not responding to the census, but the census bureau doesn't have any record anyone knows of where we've actually went out and found find someone. So what we'll do is that we're going to keep sending somebody to your house, knocking on your door till we track you down. And as a last resort, if we still can't get you, and it's getting close to time for the cutoff on things, we're going to talk to a neighbor and say, how many people live in that household? Can you give me the approximate age? Can you give me? And we'll take imputations of data to fill out the rest of it and make it happen. But we will make sure that we're counting everybody as accurate as we can. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from our audience here? Yes, please, ma'am. Since you're using so many different tools to count people, you know, internet, postcards, how are you going to make sure that there isn't a duplication? We are hiring a staff to just to look for duplications and to look for things like it. When I left Washington, D.C., moving out to L.A., one of the subject matter experts who's very high official in the bureau said, you scare me going to L.A. And I'm like, why? <laughs> he said, I can see you trying to find a way to connect with LeBron James and get LeBron James to say, take out your cell phone right now and answer the census. It's so important. And two million people go online and they go and don't have no postcard to match anything up. And we gotta hire. We gotta have all these people to match the data, make sure they somebody in the household didn't respond already, making sure or the system crashes because we don't expect too many people all at the same second that LeBron says it. And I said I will wear that badge on her proudly if I make that happen. But we are we are putting in place procedures uh, to to be able to account for whether we have duplicate answers, uh, duplicate people. Uh, Maybe the spouse did and the other one didn't tell the other one they did. I just didn't turn it in and, and then you call and you give yours in. And we have ways to QC and make that happen. 
I just want to speak to that too because um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, the, there's such a thing as an overcount. And um, in the last one, 2010, I think it was um, white U people in the U.S. were overcounted by about 1%, whereas communities of color tended to be undercounted, um, anywhere from, I think, 5% um, of Native Americans um, to 1.5% of Latinos, 2.5%, I think, of African Americans. So, um, and the overcount back then came from some, some of the areas where duplications because of um, people who owned more than one house, college students being away and filling out two different forms based on where they were. So um, I wonder if maybe with the new digital um, piece that that will help resolve some of those. Um, we're also going to be working with our libraries, community centers, and other kind of convening places where folks can come use computers. And um, I believe we are able to let the Census Bureau know that. So if they see, you know, 800 entries from the single, same IP address, like they know that that is associated with a communal spot. So they shouldn't just junk all those because it's, you know, somebody in their basement just trying to mess around. Thank you for bringing it up because that has been a question that's been raised numerous times about how many people, you know, how do we know that someone is not hacking and, and, and bots that are going in, filling out things for it. Our, our disclosure review board, they have, a, they have a cutoff point where they will start investigating and looking into it. They're going to be working with the regional office, the regional census centers, and we'll be working with our partners to say, oh, that's a faith-based center, that's a library. And we do have a national partnership with the American Library Association who are saying that all their libraries are going to be used. And as far as, as the undercount and overcount, that you're very valid on that, we have had, you know, and one of the things that we have is children is sometimes a challenge in the census. Some people say, well, my kid was born, was born March 31st. They're not a year old, so I don't count them. Okay. We also have split households. They count them in the parent or daddy's household. They count them in the mama household. Sometimes they don't count them at all in either household. So we have all those different things, and we are having statisticians and people that are looking at that data to help us to make sure that we're, we're trying to account for that. You know, last decennial was the most accurate census we've ever done, even with those high undercount and overcounts. Uh, it was still the most accurate census in history at 99 point something percent that we actually did for the overall nationwide, which we had despair, especially on, especially on uh, American and tribal lands. That was one of the highest undercounts that we had. Mm -hmm. And Thank Seattle you. King County had one of the highest response rates, I believe, in the country too, 2010. All right, yes. live here, we're this age, but I don't want to tell you X, Y, or Z. And so the, the question uh, being that if there are particular questions on the form that, that an individual did not want to complete, but they, and so partially filling out the form, how, like what happens then or how is that handled? We will accept your questionnaire, but somebody going to knock on your door most likely to follow up to try to get the additional information. Um, we want as complete and accurate sense because uh, we are making, there are so many decisions made on your data on there, on what you put in there, to we will go to every effort, but if we can't get it, if that's all we can get on there, we will take that, but our preference is to get more accountable data to help decision makers to be able to make decisions in the communities. Great, thank you. And I guess another question that I'll pose to you all, so if different parts of our communities here on the east side have varying needs and recommendations related to the census, um, how might an effort here on the east side uh, respond to those differences? I think that's one of the reasons why we're all here today. Um, I think that it's going to take a lot of specific outreach targeted to especially those hard to count communities. And we are relying on you and many others who aren't here today um, to help get that information out, to really inform communities about all these things that you've been hearing today and help prepare our whole community. Um, but I think that that's gonna take all of us to have a really successful 
and whatever we def define success. But from the census point of view and from all of us who are concerned about losing funding and other resources and representation, that means a complete and accurate count. Um, and so to be successful with that, you know, that targeted um, specific outreach. And I, I really want to appeal to cities, um, particularly here, around both having an internal plan for how you will be involved in, in the census. And also, um, you know, we had the announcement recently about the fund, uh, the $1 million fund uh, King County announced. Um, and the Seattle Foundation is going to be partnering with King County to distribute those funds for outreach efforts specifically related to this. So some of you in this room um, are definitely eligible to apply for that funding when that, when that comes out, which I believe is this summer? April 15th. April 15th. So, so we announced the fund this past Monday, April 1st, uh, one year out from Census Day 2020. And our, our goal is to open the RFP portal for applications on Monday, April 15th. And then uh, I believe we're going to close the portal on uh, May 15th. So it'll be open for about a month. And our goal is to quickly, um, you know, catalog the, the responses uh, and get awards out uh, as soon as possible, hopefully by June, definitely by July. Because, you know, communities uh, that are, are uh, getting organized and engaged and uh, concerned about the census, we need to get this money out the door yesterday. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Dylan, and I'm so pleased that you all have been advocating for that at the county level, and we certainly have too, and I just want to appeal again to our east side cities that having an internal plan, yes, is very important, but I think you're hearing today the importance of that community outreach and the relationships that many of our community li liaisons and community leaders have, and being able to help use those relationships to get this information out, and so um, would encourage when you get asks from your city staff regarding this fund, um, as a community advocate, I'm encouraging you to contribute to that because um, it is centralized, it's a pooled fund, and it helps all of us who might be applying for that money, um, helps it be with more ease, and we've been assured that money that goes in from East King County will come back out to East King County, and we'll have East Side representatives being part of that decision-making process as well. So uh, that's my plug for our investment as a community in being able to address the very things that you're talking about, David, with regards to how do we do this when there are so many different populations and communities on the east side. And uh, in uh, at the county, we're working with other jurisdictions uh, at the state, you know, we're working with the state, working with other counties. Our philosophy is to kind of align resources, align messaging, alignment, 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 because we don't want to be duplicative. We want to remove barriers to access the dollars. Um, so on the funding front, uh, I know that philanthropy, like the broader philanthropic community beyond the Seattle Foundation, uh, they're also working to raise money to get dollars to organizations, um, not just here in King County, but across the state. Uh, the Washington Census Alliance has been leading an effort down in Olympia to advocate funding f uh, from state legislators, and uh, the House budget proposed uh, House budget proposal included 12 million dollars, uh, and the Senate approved 15 or proposed 15 million dollars. So I believe that there will be some funds coming from the state, uh, assuming that it makes through uh, the end of the session. Uh, so there there is an effort, you know, beyond he just here in King County to uh, try to align dollars and make sure that those dollars are used strategically and in the best place possible to have the biggest impact. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Hi. Hi there. Um, so if that uh, citizenship question is on there, will that change your strategy of implementation? And how will you alleviate the concern from the communities that the information will not be misused? Our, we have a national advertising campaign with YNR out of New York City who are, have a contingency that they're planning to do some things. We also know that, you know, when we said we were going to have 465,000 people we budgeted to go, we know that number is going to grow up, it's going to increase. So we've got to have more people, hire more people, got to train more people, we've got to pay more people mildly, we've got to pay people more time. We're going to have to go knock on a whole lot more doors to follow up if that happens. And we have to complete the census. And we have to get an accurate census. So the cost will go up on the census and the taxpayer money is going to go up. So it's an implication from it. But we're committed to doing whatever it takes to put in the resources doing because December 31st, 2020, we will give the President of the United States, the resident population of the United States by December 31st for 2020. 
And um, I will put in a plug for uh, the need to get enumerators hired and fill these jobs that are at the Bureau. Um, I feel like the number is somewhere around 3,000 people will be hired by the Census Bureau in the state of Washington. So uh, the federal, the, hi the hiring process takes you know, a little while. It takes like four, five, six months. And so in order to have folks in place by this fall and next spring, but we need to make sure that uh, folks in our communities know that these jobs are available, that uh, we help them if they need help to apply for these jobs, and uh, you know, really make sure that we have folks filling these jobs that reflect our, the people that represent our communities. Uh, again, it goes back to the trusted messengers. And I think the stat is about one in five people who apply actually make it through the process. So if, there, if we need 3,000 people, then we need 15,000 people to apply in the state of Washington to fill these jobs. So please spread the word. All right. Well, thank you all. If there are further questions um, that either you have right now or that come up here in moments, um, please carry them in with you um, to our breakout sessions.